So present letter is devoted to chronic inflammation. So we'll discuss uh, the definitions, uh, some uh, issues about granulomatosis, repair, and all questions we studied today are chronic inflammation, definition, definition causes, general features, classification, histological um, differences, then uh, some issues of granuloma inflammation, pathogenesis of granuloma, composition of granuloma, some examples of granulomas. Also, we discuss repair issues. We'll study granulation tissue formation and contraction of wounds. So what is it chronic inflammation? Chronic inflammation uh, is defined as prolonged process in which tissue destruction and inflammation occur at the same time. Chronic inflammation can be caused by one of the following three ways. So, uh, chronic inflammation following acute inflammation, and it is possible, when the tissue destruction is extensive or the bacteria survive and persist in small numbers at the site of acute inflammation. For example, in osteomyelitis, pneumonia terminating in lung abscess. The second way, recurrent attacks of acute inflammation. When repeated bouts of acute inflammation culminate in chronicity of the process, uh, for example, in recurrent urinary tract infection leading to chronic pyelonephritis, repeated acute infection of gallbladder leading to chronic cholecystitis. Cystitis. Sometimes chronic inflammation starts de novo when the infection with organism of low pathogenicity in uh, chronic from the beginning is chronic from the beginning. For example, infection with mycobacterium tuberculosis. General features which can help us to make right diagnosis of chronic inflammation are as follows. Uh, mononuclear infiltration. Chronic inflammatory lesions are infiltrated by mononuclear inflammatory cells like phagocytes, lymphoid cells. Uh, phagocytes are uh, represented by circulating monocytes tissue macrophages, epithelioid cells, and sometimes multinucleated giant cells. The macrophages comprise the most important cells in chronic inflammation. Please remember that. We also see tissue destruction and necrosis. Tissue destruction and necrosis are common in many chronic inflammatory lesions. A broad uh, and a broad uh, about by activated macrophages by release of a variety of biologically active substances. And the third issue is proliferative changes. As a result of necrosis, proliferation of small blood vessels and fibroblasts is stimulated, resulting in formation of inflammatory granulation tissue. Eventually, healing by fibrosis and collagen laying tape place. Look here. This picture describes various uh, kinds of cells uh, in, in, in proliferative infiltrate. So here uh, on the top of the picture you see giant cells, multinucleated giant cells. Also you see another kind of cells diagnosed in the area of uh, inflammatory infiltration. For example, uh, here you see under 
uh, letter E, you see endothelial cells here, the inner layer of the vessel. Also, we can recognize plasma cells, lymphocytes. Again, here you see lymphocytes and plasma cells, histiocytes, and sometimes epithelioid cells. So they look like epithelial cells, but a little bit different. We see systemic effects of growing inflammation, such as fever. Invariably, there is mild fever, often with loss of weight and weakness. Uh, anemia. Yes, we know that chronic inflammation is accompanied by anemia of varying degree. We see also sometimes leukocytosis. As in acute inflammation, chronic inflammation also has leukocytosis. By general, there is relatively lymphocytosis uh, in these cases. ESP is elevated in all cases of chronic inflammation. Uh, amyloidosis, long-term cases of chronic, uh, chronic separated inflammation may develop secondary systemic amyloidosis, so AA amyloidosis. Please remember that various kinds of long-term separative inflammation, for example, chronic osteomyelitis, may result in secondary systemic amyloidosis. Or chronic dysentery may result in amyloidosis and other chronic separative diseases. We can classify chronic inflammation into non-specific and specific one. So what is it non-specific? Non-specific when the irritant substance produces a non-specific chronic inflammatory reaction with formation of granulation tissue and healing by fibrosis. For example, chronic osteomyelitis, chronic ulcer, and other diseases. Specific. We call specific when the injurious agent causes a characteristic histologic tissue response. For example, tuberculosis, lymphosis, syphilis. And it means that we can make right diagnose just looking at the tissue pattern. Chronic, uh, we also may uh, classify chronic nonspecific inflammation as chronic nonspecific interstitial inflammation, then chronic nonspecific interstitial inflammation with, with formation of polyps and pointed condylomas, and also chronic granulomatous inflammation. So let's discuss all kinds of that chronic inflammation. So look, here you see the example of interstitial inflammation, non-specific. Here the sample, tissue sample of myocardium. You see myocardial fibers and here we see so-called like fluorid myocarditis, which is defined by the presence of myofibro inflammation with necrosis. So we see mainly mononuclear cells, uh, but is mixed with some scattered neutrophils as well. The pattern is that of a patchy myocarditis. Um, so, for example, that kind of inflammation we can see in myocardium in case of Toxoplasma gondii infection, which occurs is in immunocompromised patients. Um, and so, other chronic inflammations in such patients may uh, result in such kind of histological, histological picture. So, another example of the same pathology, 
we see interstitial lymphocytic infiltrates, for example, in case of viral myocarditis, uh, which is probably the most common type of myocarditis. There is usually little accompanying myofibronecrosis. So here you see some, some tiny fossae of necrosis. Many of these cases are probably subclinical, but findings may include fever and chest pain. In severe cases, cardiac failure leads to dyspnea and fatigue. The first manifestation may be arrhythmia in patients, which can be a cause for sudden death in young people. A late uh, sequela may be dilated cardiomyopathy. The most common viral agents are um, Coxsackie viruses A and B, and people infected with HIV can have similar findings. About 5% of patients with Lyme disease also may develop myocarditis. Um, let's discuss the issue of chronic non-specific interstitial inflammation with formation of polyps and pointed condylums. It occurs on the mucous membranes and in the areas borderline with squamous epithelium. Polyps are the end result of prolonged chronic irritation. So nas, nasal, cervical, colorectal polyps are common. Macroscopically, grossly, with naked eye, we see that um, they are gelatinous masses with smooth and shiny surface. Under microscope, they are composed of loose adenomatous connective tissue with some mucous glands and of course, and that is very important, we see inflammatory cells like lymphocytes, plasmocytes, and eosinophils. What is it, condyloma? Condyloma, a raised growth a squamous cell epithelium and connective tissue of skin resembling a what, typically in the genital region, they are caused by viral infections, for example, in case of syphilis, and um, they are transmissible by contact. So again, localization, coronal sulcus of the penis or the perineal area. Um, please remember that in, in, the, in case of condyloma, in stroma, there are hyperemic vessels and we see also infiltrates of lymphocytes, plasma cells, with a mixture of leukocytes. Here you see the uh, samples, uh, gross material of nasal polyps. These two polyps were removed from the left nasal cavity. Such polyps are fairly common at all ages and they are inflammatory in origin. Under microscope, please see, look here, you see the inf inflammatory infiltration, and we see lymphocytes, we see plasma cells, um, we see uh, here the a lot of vessels, edema of stroma. Here you see uh, um, so ciliated epithelium here, um, multi, multi layer squamous epithelium. Chronic granulomatous inflammation. Granuloma is defined as a circumscribed tiny lesion about one millimeter in diameter uh, composed predominantly of collection of modified macrophages called epithelioid cells and rimmed at the periphery by lymphoid cells. 
The word granuloma is composed of granule, meaning circumscribed granule-like lesion, and oma, the ending, um, which is a suffix commonly used for true tumors. But here, it indicates inflammatory mass or collection of macrophages. So you uh, here you see the picture. You can see the same picture in your book. So uh, the formation of granuloma. So weak acute inflammatory response to mycobacterium of tuberculosis. Um, stimulate macrophages, and then mediation, T-cells mediated response, um, immune response, and poorly digestible agent as myco mycobacterium tuberculosis, tuberculosis. Then activation CD4 T-cells, and then release of uh, lymphokines, intralekin 1, 2, grow various growth fa factors. And that, that is a uh, monocyte hematactic factor. This stimulate accumulation of tissue macrophages, proliferation of T cells. Uh, macrophages are activated by EF and uh, gamma factor. And that caused the transformation to uh, these macrophages to epithelioid cells and then to uh, giant cells formation. And that is also stimulated by some cytokines like TGF factor and PDGF factors. And then the, and in the end, we see granuloma. So please look at this picture. There's various kinds of granuloma under microscope. Here you see the arrow shows you the multinucleated giant cells. Here you see here you see the granulomas, and grossly you see the sample of the lung with multiple forty on granuloma formation. So the uh, red outline highlights this distinct structure of the barricade caused by immune cells bunching together to surround the offending culprit in the center, like one big ring, a ring of roses. The arrow shows a multinucleated giant cell formed of multiple macrophages then, that have fused together. There are various kinds of granulomas. By the way, we have more than 70 various kinds of histological pattern of granulomas. But we can divide these granulomas into infectious and non-infectious granulomas. And we can see uh, granuloma formation in case of foreign body in the tissues and also in case of immune pathology, we call it immune granulomas. So here you see the sample histological slide uh, of the uh, myocardium of the heart in case of rheumatic heart disease. And here you see the accumulation of the cells we call it Ashof nodule at high magnification. The most uh, characteristic cellular component is the Ashof giant cells in case of rheumatism, rheumatic heart disease. This disease has an immune component. We'll study this disease later in the second, um, in second term, so the sixth term. So the Ashov giant cell, very characteristic to this pathology. Several of these appear here as a large cells with two or more nuclei here, look, two or more nuclei that have prominent nucleoli. 
Scattered inflammatory cells accompany them and can be mononuclear cells or occasionally neutrophils. Such inflammation can occur not only in the myocardium, but also in the endocardium, including valves. And we see sometimes such granulomas in epicardium. So involvement of all three cardiac layers is termed pancarditis. Myocardial involvement leads to death in about 1% of patients with acute rheumatic fever. Again, here you see the uh, um, example of myocarditis. So you see the ma microscopic pattern of this pathology. There is a granuloma with the giant cells in here, along with myocyte necrosis. No infectious organism can be found. So the term applied here is simply giant cell myocarditis. This is a rare idiopathic form of myocarditis seen mostly in young to middle aged adults. And it has a poor prognosis, unfortunately. So here you see colon diverticulum, um, this low magnification. We see this area of diverticulum and hematoxylin eosin stain shows the, uh, the inflammatory, chronic inflammatory infiltration of the colon's wall. Under high magnification, we see that in the wall of the colon, the reticulum, chronic inflammation and the formation of giant cells. Here, look, here, giant cells, giant cells, giant cells, giant cells, such as sometimes these giant cells like a foreign bodies. This is a, f and also see some inflammatory infiltrate like lymphocytes, plasma cells here. How did it cyst in the right lung? Here's the lung, and so here you see how did it cyst. So the white laminated membrane is present within the capsule of granulation tissue formed by the host as a response to the how did it cyst. And this is an example of foreign body reaction. This child came from a sheep raising part of Australia. Uh, this tissue sample um, we see here presented lung with tuberculosis. So we see the miliary tuberculosis as a form of tuberculosis. Uh, and it, it is characterized by a wide dissemination into the human body and by the tiny size of the lesions. So between one and five millimeters uh, in diameter. Its name comes from a distinctive pattern of many tiny spots distributed throughout the lung uh, with the appearance similar to millet seals. You see, it's, thus the term miller tuberculosis is used quite often. So here you see the tuberculosis of the testes uh, and, and epididymis. The testes contain multiple rounded granulomatous lesions. The epididymis is almost completely replaced by similar tissue. So this patient ha had disseminated tuberculosis. Here you see the gross picture of the liver with uh, miliary tuberculosis. So uh, liver showing miliary tubercules throughout the both lobes. These appear as a tiny yellow spots beneath the capsule. Can you see? I hope you can see them quite clearly. 
So here, the uh, tissue sample of aorta was with syphilitic mesotitis. So look, the aorta compared with the normal one um, has the intima with irregular wrinkling, fine ochres with irregularities on the surface produced by scattered inflammation with fibrosis, producing the characteristic tree bark appearance. So uh, let's discuss some specific granulomas. The granuloma we call, as I said before, granulomas, which have specific uh, histological pattern, which helps us to make right diagnosis. In tuberculosis, the granuloma is referred to as a tubercle and is classically characterized by the presence of central cassius necrosis. Remember it. In case of tuberculoma, we see central cassius necrosis uh, surrounded uh, by epithelioid cells, lymphocytes, plasma cells, and giant uh, Langham cells. In contrast, cassius necrosis is rare in another granulomatous diseases. Corn focus. So here, look here, this is a corn focus. In the first segment of the right lung of this patient, a focus of compaction of rocket density is determined. In the context of this focus is a yellowish gray color with calcification up here. This is the end stage of tuberculoma. So look again about uh, the histology of tuberculosis, tubercle. So you see uh, in this, there is a central cassation necrosis surrounded by elongated epithelioid cells, giant uh, Langan cells look here, and periphery with lymphocyte infiltration. Again, miliary tuberculosis. So here in the center, we see cassius necrosis, then uh, the rim of epithelioid cells, some giant cell here, giant cell, giant cell, giant cells, few giant cells, multinucleated, Langhans cells, and also at periphery we see uh, the rim of uh, lymphocytes. Again, typically tuberculous granuloma showing an area of central necrosis. Here, look, central necrosis. We see also this necrosis surrounded by epithelioid cell and multiple Langhans type giant cells here. You see giant multinucleate lung cancer cells and lymphocytes. Please note that really uh, we can't see here plasma cells. And that is very important to remember that plasma cell we'll see in another kind of granuloma in case of syphilis, but not tubercul tuberculosis. Here you see again the picture of miliary tuberculosis in lung. Remember again, we see here central necrosis, cassius necrosis. Also, we see epithelioid cells and giant lung cells. Here you see multiple tuberculomas with central necrosis in some giant cells, even uh, not on the high magnification, could be diagnosed. So what happens next with, uh, uh, with tubercle? 
what is the evolution so we see as i said before that epithelioid cells due to various steps of activation macrophages uh, the, the activation result in epithelioid cell formation and so uh, we see the central necrosis, lung cells, epithelioid cells, and giant cells, and uh, the, um, the outer layer on um, uh, fibroblasts. Here, look, here we see again the center with gaseous necrosis surrounded by epithelioid cells, lung guns, giant cells and peripheral rim of lymphocy lymphocytes bounded by fibroblasts here, okay? So let's go to syphilis. And remember that syphilis granuloma is called GUMA. GUMA consists of central area of fibrinoid, occasions necrosis surrounded by mononuclear inflammatory cells and please remember mostly plasma cells okay mostly plasma cells also we can recognize some lymphocytes epithelial cells and seldom this keyword that they are seldom giant lung cells around gamma the granulation tissue and we see also the endovasculitis. So here you see gammas. Uh, we see casual necrosis. Uh, also, um, and also chronic inflammatory infiltrate, and also that is very important. The vasculitis. Uh, namely obliterative and, uh, and arteritis. So here you see histological slide, a slide of aorta. And in case of syphilis, uh, we may diagnose syphilitic mesartitis. In the outer and middle membranes of aorta, along the vasa vasotum, a gummy infiltrate consisting of lymphoid, plasma, and epithelioid cells macrophages is visible. Infiltrate, here you see some infiltrates. So these infiltrates destroy the elastic fibers of the middle membrane. Uh, and um, after this destruction, the, uh, the connective tissue develops in these areas. Syphilis is a venereal sexually transmitted disease caused by spirohatus trypanema pallidum. Other trypanema, trypanemal disease are yours, Pinta, and Bejel. The word syphilis is derived from the name of the uh, mythological handsome boy Syphilis, who was um, cursed by Greek god Apollo with the disease. Histologically, the chancro has the following featuring features. Dense infiltrate of mainly plasma cells, again, please remember. Lymphocytes are very important to, to remember as a part of the cell infiltrate. And also few macrophages can be seen. Very vascular aggregation of mononuclear cells particularly plasma cells. So we see periarteritis and endarteritis. And also proliferation of vascular endothelium may cause the obliteration of the vessels. So here you see various kinds of syphilis. You must remember primary syphilis uh, primary lesion uh, on the glands penis, the secondary syphilis, 
um, mucus patches on oral and vaginal mucosa and generalized skin eruptions. And in case tertiary, uh, tertiary uh, syphilis, we see localized lesions as gammas uh, of liver with uh, scarring um, of uh, the liver. And also we see the diffuse diffuse lesions in our time, uh, like aneurysm, um, nearing of mouths of coronary, coronary ostia, and incompetence of aortic valve ring. Also, the nervous system is involved. So, syphilitic gum of the liver. So, central necrosis. Uh, is surrounded by palisades of macrophages and plasma cells, marginate, marginated peripherally by fibroblasts. Leprosia, or Hansen's disease. After discovery of causative uh, organism by Hansen in 1874, was first described in ancient Indian Ducks going back to 6th century. Uh, it is a chronic non-fatal infectious disease affecting mainly the cooler parts of the body, such as the skin, mouth, respiratory tract, eyes, peripheral nerves, superficial lymph nodes, and testes. Though the uh, earliest and, may, um, and main involvement in leprosia is of the skin and nerves, but in bacteremia from endothelial colonization or by bacilli filtered from blood by reticular endothelial system. Um, you must remember that other organs such as liver, spleen, bone marrow, and lymph nodes are also involved. Advanced cases may develop secondary amyloidosis and renal disease, uh, both of which are of immunologic origin. That is why this patient may die due to renal insufficiency, for example. So you must remember how the um, how the granuloma in case of uh, leprosy looks like. There is a collection of proliferative foam macrophages, so-called lepra cells in the dermis, which are clear sub-epidermal zone. So here, look, the clear area, thin epidermis, and here you see the foam form uh, lepra cells. Lepra bacilli in lepra uh, very well seen in case of fight feroca stain. They can be recognized as globi and cigarettes in pack appearance inside the foam macrophages. Without such kind of stain, we can't see this um, bacilli, lepra bacilli, but if we use the fight ferraca stain, we can easily recognize uh, the bacilli. So in the dermis, there is a proliferation of macrophages with form a change, particularly around the blood vessels, nerves, and general appendages. The forming macrophages are called lepra cells or Virchow cells. The lepra cells are heavily laden with acid fast bacilli, demonstrated with acid fast bacteria stain. The acid fast bacteria may be seen, uh, may be seen as a compact globular masses, globi, or arranged, as I said before, in parallel fashion like cigarettes and pack. The dermal infiltrate of lepra cells characteristically does not encroach upon the 
basal layer of epidermis and is separated from epidermis as I, as I have already shown you. They are separated by subepidermal uninvolved clear zone. The kind of tuberculoid leprosia. The dermal lesion show granulometers uh, appearance or pattern which resemble tuberculosis composed of epithelioid cells, lung cells, and peripheral mantle or lymphocytes. Uh, lesions in of tuberculoid leprosia have um, predilection for dermal nerves, which may be destroyed and infiltrated by epithelioid cells and lymphocytes. The granulomas, gran granulomatous infiltrates erodes the basal layer of epidermis. And in that case, we, we can't see clear zone. So here, look at the picture. No, no clear zones. So you see here um, the epidermis, this derma, and here you see the granuloma. And in this kind of uh, lepra, uh, the lepra basally are few and seen in destroyed nerves. The other so-called specific inflammation is renal scleroma. This is cyanonasal renal scleroma granuloma, the other name scleroma, during florid stage with marked cellular infiltrates consisting of lymphocytes and plasma cells. There are many macrophages with clear to form a cytoplasm, so-called mucolic cells that harbor calypsular renal scleromatis. So here, uh, very well seen with what in starry steam. Um, now let's go to proliferative inflammation around um, Hinacocus of the liver. Um, the area of the liver's tissue with dystrophic pink color, hitinous membrane, and surrounded necrotic tissue are seen. We'll see it a little bit later. In peripheral areas, crowded lymphocytes, plasma cells, fibroblasts, and single giant cells of the foreign bodies can be found. And outside, we see the fibrous capsule. Here you see the Echinococcus granuloma, so hard at its cyst with fluid and so called daughter cysts. So here you see the Echinococcus granuloma again, hard at its cyst of liver. The patient had lived in a sheep raising area of Australia. But this was an incidental post-mortem finding. So no special system during life of this patient. So you see the outer, you see a very thick fibrotic wall of the cyst. And also we see the cyst which is filled with multiple so-called daughter cysts of varying size. Uh, the same pathology, we see here the cyst, um, and it looks that this cyst infiltrate into adjacent tissue, and we see areas of necrosis and calcifications in this, um, in this organ. Under microscope, we see uh, the structure of the uh, um, cyst wall as uh, the inner layer contains nuclei, gives rise to broad capsule attached by shock stock in infections. Then we see laminated membrane beneath germinal layer. It is avascular, eosinophilic. 
refractile and hitiners, strongly pass positive, GMS positive. And at, at the end, the outer layer is dense fibrovascular tissue with chronic inflammatory infiltration and variable calcification develops after five and more years of such pathology. So here under microscope, the histological slide of uh, the wall of the cyst. Uh, bubbles of alveolar cocus are surrounded by a itinous shell, intensively colored with in pink. Around the blister is a zone of hepatic necrosis. Here, the area of necrosis. Uh, on the border with necrosis, there are clusters of macrophages. Here are the macrophages infiltrations. Uh, we see also some such giants. Uh, look, here you see multinucleated cells, but what is different from, for example, tuberculosis, that uh, all these, all these uh, cells, giant cells, are look looks uh, look uh, different from tuberculosis, because uh, we see the pattern uh, pattern in case of tuberculosis like a, a horseshoe uh, pattern the ring of the um, nuclear but here you see sort of mass uh, of nuclear multinucleated giant foreign body so-called foreign body cells also we see fibroblast and uh, connective tissue proliferation, which uh, involved in uh, capsule formation. Again, you see a hydrated cyst in, of the kidney, um, the unruptured, white, laminated membrane of the cyst can be seen in the upper pool of the organ it had compressed by cell system causing hydronephrosis. The kidney was removed because the clinical and radiological features resembled those of the primary renal tumor. There was no history of exposure to sheep farming. So it was wrong diagnosed, primary the tumor was diagnosed, but after the surgery, we see that it is not a tumor, it is a hydrated cyst. So what are the outcomes of chronic inflammation? Main outcomes are sclerosis, hyalinosis, and amyloidosis. So here you see the sample of spleen with amyloidosis. So grossly, we see sebaceous spleen, uh, Congo red color. This stain gives this reddish appearance on the microscope. So in the lymphoid follicles, intima of arteries and red pulp along the reticular fibers Deposits of brown-red amyloid mass are visible, here you see. So this is amyloidosis, secondary amyloidosis is a result of chronic inflammation. Again, amyloidosis of spleen, so-called sebaceous spleen. So in lymphoid follicles, intima of arteries and red pulp, as I said before, uh, and within, along with reticular fibers, we see the uh, deposits of amyloid. Here we see amyloidosis of spleen, but not sebaceous. Uh, we see saga spleen here. In the intima, um, in the intima of the central arteries, 
and in lymphoid follicle there are deposits of amyloid mass masses here look uh, the amyloid masses another picture remember uh, we have already studied the amyloid doses so the congo red is a special staining for amyloidosis. So here you see a thyroid gland with, um, with deposits of amyloid. Again, the amyloidosis, but here in myocardium, here uh, between cardiomyocytes, we see here some vessels and perivascular connective tissue um, with amyloidosis masses and look the uh, muscle cells are atrophic here you see the amyloidosis of lungs again congruent coloring along the basal membranes of blood vessels and in the interstitium along the reticular fibers we see the deposits of amyloid so, a uh, few words about healing, healing of various injuries. So, uh, healing is the body response to the injury in an attempt to restore normal structure and function. It involves two distinct processes. The first one is regeneration, when healing takes place by proliferation of parenchymal cells and usually results in complete restoration of the original tissues. Uh, repair, when healing takes place by proliferation of connective tissue, uh, resulting in fibrosis and scarring. At times, both processes take place sometimes simultaneously. So, a few words about regeneration. Some parenchymal cells are short-lived, while others have a longer lifespan. In order to maintain proper structure of tissue, these cells are under the constant regulatory control of their cell cycle. These include growth factors such as epidermal growth factor, fibroblast growth factor, platelet-derived growth factor, endothelial growth factor and transforming growth factor B. So all cells of the body have various capacities to divide. And we can recognize labile cells. These cells continue to multiply throughout the life under normal phys physiological conditions. Um, these include surface um, surface um, epithelial cells of the epidermis, uh, digestive system, respiratory tract, urinary system, vagina, cervix, uterine endometrium, um, blood cells, bone marrow cells, cells of lymph nodes, spleens. The other group are stable cells. These cells decrease or lose their ability to proliferate after adolescence, but retain the capacity to multiply in response to stimuli throughout adult life. These include, for example, parenchymal cells of organs like liver, pancreas, kidneys, adrenal and thyroid glands, mesenchymal cells like smooth muscle cells, fibroblasts, vascular endothelium, bone and cartilage cells. And the third group, permanent cells. These cells lose the ability to proliferate around the time of birth. These cells include neurons of nervous system, skeletal muscles, and cardiac muscle cells. Um, in the three types of parenchymal cells described above are correlated with the phase of cell cycle following uh, inferences can be derived. So, uh, lipases, which are continuously dividing cells, remain in this cell cycle from one mitosis to the next. 
Stable cells are in the resting phase, but can be stimulated to enter the cell cycle. And permanent cells are non-dividing cells which have left the cell cycle and die after the injury. So here you see various kind of the cell cycle um, and according to the type of cells. So repair. Repair is the replacement of injured tissue by fibrous tissue. Sometimes um, the end of inflammation is sclerosis. Two processes are involved in repair. In that, in that case, of with the, uh, um, the outcome of inflammation. So we see um, it's starting with granulation, tissue formation, and the second, contraction of wounds. Repair responses takes place by participation of mesenchymal cells consisting of connective tissue stem cells, fibrocytes, and histocytes. Also, endothelial cells, macrophages, platelets, and the parenchymal cells of the injured organs involved. So here, look, the uh, picture on the top, you see uh, numerous vessels. Also, you see cell infiltrates, some ulceration in case of chronic inflammation. Uh, so we see active granulation tissue with cell infiltrate and many tiny capillaries, new vessels. So new vessels or uh, vascularization, new vessels formation. So uh, other words we call this kind of tissue as young fibrous tissue in loose matrix. The term granulation tissue derives, uh, uh, derives its name from slightly granular and pink appearance of the tissue. Each cranial corresponds histologically to proliferation of new uh, small blood vessels, which are slightly lifted on the surface by thin covering on fibroblasts and young collagen. So we can recognize three phases uh, in um, information of granulation tissue. The first phase of inflammation um, is um, about um, formation of acute inflammatory response. So following trauma, blood clots are seen at the site of injury. We see uh, exudation of plasma, neutrophils, and some monocytes within 24 hours. Then the next phase of clearance, so combination of proteolytic enzymes liberated from neutrophils, autolytic enzymes from dead tissue cells and phagocytic activity of macrophages clear off the necrotic tissue, debris, and red blood cells. And the last phase of the ingrowth of granulation tissue. Um, this phase consists of two main processes, angiogenesis or neovascularization, as is as I uh, described you before, the new capillary formation, so neovascularization, and also fibrogenesis. So here you see picture of granulation tissue seven to ten days to ten days after trauma, and after two or three months we see. Uh, scar formation, scar tissue. So if we look under microscope in granulation tissue, we see chronic inflammatory cells, 
fibroblasts, myofibroblasts, and um, capillaries. Contraction of wounds, in order to explain the mechanism of wound contraction, a um, number of factors have been proposed. So first, dehydration as a result of removed of fluid by drying of wounds, and first suggested but without being subst substantial. The second contraction of collagen was thought to be responsible for contraction, but wound contraction proceeds at a stage when the collagen contact of granulation tissue is very small. And then discovery of myofibroblasts appearing in active granulation tissue has resolved the controversy surrounding the mechanism of wound contraction. These cells have features intermediate between those of fibroblasts and smooth muscle cells. Their migration into wound area and their active contraction decreases the size of the defect. So healing of the skin wounds provides a classical example of combination of regeneration and repair. So uh, we, can, uh, we can find find out healing by first intention, so-called primary union, and also uh, the other way possible healing by second intention or secondary union. So uh, let's discuss primary union of skin wounds. So the incised wound as, a, as well as a Sadura tract on either side are filled with blood clot, and there is inflammatory response from the margins. Here you see this example. Then spurs of epidermal cell migrate along the incised margin on either side, as well as around the um, sutura tract. Formation of granulation tissue also begins from below, and then, removal of sutura or at around seventh day result in scar tissue at the size of incision and sutura tract. So you see here the mature collagen tissues. The other way, uh, described by secondary union of skin bones. So for example, the open wound is filled with blood clot and there is inflammatory response at the junction of the um, viable tissues. Then epithelial spurs from margins of wound meet in the middle of cover, um, cover of the gap and separate the underlying visible tissue from necrotic tissue uh, at the surface forming scab. After contraction of the wound, a scar smaller than the original wound is left. Again, we see uh, mature collagen tissue, the collagen scar. There are some complications of wound healing. The first infection of wound due to entry of bacteria delays the healing. Then it could be epidermal cyst formation due to persistence of epithelial cells in the uh, wound after healing. We see sometimes pigmentation. So healed wounds may at times have a rust-like color due to stain with hemosiderin. You, you know this pigment. Some colored uh, Particulate material left in the wound may persist and in part color the healed wound. And deficient scar formation. This may occur due to inadequate formation of granulation tissue. Incisional hernia, a weak scar, especially after laparotomy, may, decide, may be the site of bursting open of a wound or an incisional hernia, then uh, hypertrophied scars, 
uh, result in keloid formation. At times, the scar formed is excessive, ugly, and painful. So excessive formation of collagen in healing may result in so-called keloid or claw-like formation seen more commonly in blacks. Hypertrophied scars differ from keloid in that they are confined to the borders of the initial wound like keloids. They have tumor-like projections of connective tissue. Also excessive contraction and exaggeration of wound contraction may result in formation of contractures or cicatrization. For example, in Dupuytren's palmar contracture, plantar contracture, and Peyronie's disease. And at the end, neoplasia. It is rare complication, but sometimes scar may be in the site of the for the development of carcinoma later. For example, squamous cell carcinoma following burns on the skin. So uh, healing could be different in various tissues, so-called um, specialized tissues. Fracture healing. Healing of fracture may be callus formation, depends upon some clinical consideration whether the fracture is traumatic in previously normal bone or pathological in previously diseased bone, complete or incomplete, uh, like green stick fracture and simple close, uh, commuted uh, or compound uh, healing. However, basic events in healing of any type of fracture are similar and resemble healing of skin wound to some extent. So, let's discuss these ways of the fracture healing. Primary unions of, union of fractures occurs in a few special situations when the ends of fractures are approximated as it done by application of compression clamps. In these cases, bony union takes place with formation of medullary callus uh, without periosteal callus formation. The patient can be made ambulatory early, but there is more extensive bone necrosis and slow healing. Secondary union is more common process of fracture healing. Though it is continuing process, secondary bone union is described under the following three healing. Procallus formation, osseoscallus formation, and at the end, remodeling. So there are various, uh, a few stages of this fracture healing. So first, we see hematoma formation and local inflammatory response at the fracture side. Here you see. Then we see the ingrowth of granulation tissue with formation of soft tissue callus. And you remember that granulation tissue is immature connective tissue, rich with uh, new vessels, infl inflammatory infiltrate, and some fibroblasts. Um, then we see the formation of procallus uh, composed of uh, woven bone and cartilage with uh, its characteristic fusiform appearance and having three arbitrary components, external, intermediate, and internal callus. Then formation of osseous, uh, osseous callus composed of lamella bone following clearance of woven bone and cartilage, and at the end, uh, remodel bone ends. The external colors cleared away, intermediate colors uh, converted into lamella bone, and internal colors developing bone marrow cavity. Uh, what are the complications of fracture healing? The fibrous union may result instead of osseous union uh, if the immobilization of fraction bone is not done. Occasionally, a false joint may develop at the fracture sites and we call it pseudoarthrosis. 
Non-union may result in some soft tissue is interposed between the fractured ends. And the third way, delayed union may occur from causes of delayed wound healing, in general such as infection, inadequate blood supply, pure nutrition, movement, and old age. Healing of the nervous system. Uh, there are two various um, groups, central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. The nerve cells of the brain, spinal cord and ganglia, once destroyed, are not replaced. Axons of central nervous system also do not show any significant regeneration. The damaged uh, neuroglial cells, however, may show proliferation of astrocytes called gliosis. Uh, what about peripheral nervous system? The peripheral nerves show regeneration mainly from proliferation of Schwann cells and fibrils from distal end. Then myelin sheath and axon of the intact distal nerve undergo uh, valerian degeneration up to the next node of Ranvir Tovas to proximal end. Degenerated debris are cleared away by macrophages. Regeneration in the form of sprouting of fibrils take place from the viable end of axon. These uh, fibrils grow along the track of degenerated nerve so that in about six or seven weeks, the peripheral stump consists of the tube filled with elongated Schwann cells. When the fibrils from proximal stump enters the old neural tube and develops into new uh, functional axon. What about muscles? The regeneration of stri striated muscles. Uh, you must remember that it is similar to peripheral nerves. On injury, the cut ends of muscle fibers retract but are held together by stromal connective tissue. The injured site is filled with fibrinous material, polymorphs, and macrophages. After clearance of damaged fibers by macrophages, one of the following two types of regeneration of muscle fibers can occur. If the muscle sheath is intact, sacrolemmal tubes containing histocytes appeared along the end of Mygel tube, which in about three months' time restores properly oriented muscle fibers. For example, in Zanka's degeneration of muscles in case of typhoid fever. If the muscle sheath is damaged, it forms a disorganized multinucleate mass and scar composed of fibrovascular uh, tissue. For example, in case of Volkmann's ischemic contraction. Um, let's imagine smooth muscle and cardiac muscle regeneration repair. non striated muscles has limited regenerative capacity. Appearance of smooth muscle in an arteriose in granulation tissue However, in large destructive lesions, the smooth muscle is replaced by permanent scar tissue. So, as I said before, the damage of muscle cells replaced by uh, connective tissue. Cardiac muscles. Also, destruction of heart muscles is replaced by fibrous tissue. However, in situation where the endomysium of individual cardiac fiber is intact, for example, in case such uh, disease, in case of such diseases as diphtheria or Coxsackie uh, virus infection, regeneration of cardiac fibers may occur in young patients. Uh, healing of solid epithelial organs, for example. Kidney, liver, thyroid. 
uh, it depends on uh, the injury. So the replacement sometimes by fibrous car, uh, but uh, when the basement membrane is intact, um, regeneration may occur. For example, in tumor and cruises of kidney with intact, so not damaged basement membrane, proliferation and small migration of tubal epithelial cell may, may occur to form the renal tubules. In viral hepatitis, if part of the liver lobule is damaged with intact stromal network, proliferation of hepatocytes may result in restoration of liver lobe. Mucosal surfaces, the cells of mucosal surfaces have very good regeneration and are normally being lost and replaced continuously. For example, in elementary tract, respiratory tract, urinary tract, endometrium, etc. This occurs by proliferation from uh, margins, migration, multilayering, and differentiation of epithelial cells in the same way as in the epidermal cells in healing of skin wounds. So these are the main issues of chronic inflammation, regeneration, and repair. That's, um, that's it for today. Thank you for your attention.